two Daves for the price of one this morning. Uh, I'll read you the scripture, I promise. Uh, and uh, my name is David. As I just said, I'm the liturgist here at the church. But this morning, it's my pleasure to be delivering the sermon, uh, which I do about once a month here at St. Andrews. If you've been keeping track, uh, you'll see me about once a month. And the days I preach are fairly randomly decided. Uh, maybe Pastor Peter will be out of town, he needs me to cover, or there's just a day that happens to work. Uh, but the scriptures I'm asked to preach on will just be whatever was assigned that day and that I happen to be preaching on. But I felt a bit of providence in the way things lined up today based off of what I preached on last time I was up here. Last time, if you remember, since we've been moving through the book of John, I preached on the moment, the sad moment, when Peter denies knowing Jesus. And we talked about how that was a low point, a valley in Peter's life. Well, we see that happen with Peter, and then we don't see the reunion between Jesus and Peter, what happens when they meet again, until now in the scripture. So, when I left off last time, looking at this moment with Peter, and then I read what I was preaching on for today, I said, well, this is the closure to that story arc. And in fact, it's interesting, looking through the other Gospels, you know, every single Gospel mentions Peter's denial of Christ. But only the book of John has the reunion between Jesus and the reconciliation between the two of them. So we'll get into a deeper discussion of what Jesus says to Peter next week. But today we're going to see the moment of reunion. So it seemed providential to me to be able to start to close that story arc for Peter himself. So let's read it. It's in John chapter 21 at the very beginning. And this is Jesus has resurrected he has already appeared to his disciples, although not Peter by name. We can assume Peter was with the, the disciples when he uh, met with them, but we haven't gotten on the page, the reunion, until now. And this is John 21. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, so there he is, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, and gave it to them, and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So as I alluded to, this is the first time we get Peter and Jesus, at least narratively in the book of John, back on the same page together. And so what happens? And that's what I want to look at. What was Peter's reaction? We've been left in some amount of suspense since the last time we saw Peter. And this is what happens. As soon as Simon Peter heard 
him say, the other disciples say, it is the Lord. He wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. Now this is quite an emotional reaction. As soon as Peter sees it's Jesus, he automatically leaps out of the boat and runs toward him. It's a very emotional moment. When I picture it happening in my mind, it's one of those, you know, common motifs in films where you'll see two people who have been separated and they'll see each other from a distance. Maybe it's, it's two lovers that have been separated or, or a parents and a child that has been lost. And then you'll hear the swelling music. You know, you can probably picture a scene from a movie that you've seen and they start running towards each other. And that seems to be the moment that Peter is in. All of a sudden, he knows it's Jesus, and he leaps off of the boat and runs to him. It's emotional. It's impulsive. It's a little bit irresponsible. As N.T. Wright points out, Peter, who longed to see Jesus again and clearly still had unfinished unfinished business with him, grabbed a cloak and leapt into the sea, once again doing the impulsive thing, this time leaving the others to do the hard work. So there's a little bit of him letting the other guys bring the fish in. But if you hear what N.T. Wright says there, once again doing the impulsive thing. Because Peter is probably our most impulsive disciple. He's the one that, you know, he's the friend that if somebody's threatening you, he'll all of a sudden cut their ear off. (laughs) Or you have to say, settle down, Peter. I'm glad you're so zealous, but... It's all right. Or he'll, he's the one that'll jump into the water and walk on it with you. So this reaction is what George Beasley Murray in his commentary called characteristically Peter. This kind of impulsive, emotional reaction. And there's another word I think of when I think of it, which is childlike. That there's a childlike joy here in the actions of Peter. And the reason that comes to me is because I've had experiences like this before, little common experiences, but what will often happen is when I come home from work, I will will park in front of our apartment building, and the way things time out is that often, just before that, my wife will have picked up our son, and they'll take the dog for a walk. And so we have a park across the street from our apartment building, and Once in a while, I'll park and I'll see them out on the walk. And so I'll come and meet them, and it's a surprise. And it's not that big of a deal. It happens pretty often. I don't have any presents or anything with me. But what will happen is that even on these little mundane moments, my son will see me, and he didn't know I was going to be there, and he runs to me. He runs, and he gives me a big hug, and he's so happy. Dave's happy too. Uh, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's nothing special, but it's this moment of him running. And my wife will sometimes even let the dog off the leash, and the dog will run to me. And the dog's jumping up on me, or tail's wagging, my son's hugging me. My wife doesn't usually run over, but, uh, <laughs> but that's the point. Who does that? Well, it's a, it's a, childlike, it's a childlike response, right? Because you're just all of a sudden full of this ebullient joy of reunion. And that's what I see when I see this in Peter. Whatever's going on, all of a sudden he knows it's Jesus and he jumps out of that boat and he runs. He runs to be reunited with them. Does Jesus like it when we act in this childlike way? Well, we know what happened when Jesus was hanging out with the children Earlier in the Gospels, a group of people brought their children to Jesus while he was preaching. The disciples tried to keep them away so he wouldn't be bothered, but Jesus famously says this, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. It's not just a statement of Jesus saying, I like little kids, it's okay. He says, no, if you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, you need to be like them. You need to have a childlike heart. And so when we think of Peter, who's so characteristically 
childlike in so many ways, it's not a surprise when we hear these words of Jesus that which disciple is given the keys to the kingdom? Of course, it's Peter. In Matthew 16, when Jesus is asking the disciples what the crowds are saying about him, he turns to them and says, who do you say I am? And it's Simon Peter, of course, the impulsive one, that's ready to go. He's that kid in class that's got his hand up right away. And this is what he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He's ready to answer it, and he gives the right answer. And Jesus sees that, and he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven in heaven. So I don't think it's a coincidence that we see this childlike behavior in Peter. We see Jesus saying, it's those that are such as these children that will be given the kingdom of heaven, and he hands the keys to Peter. So why is being childlike something that we should value when it comes to our relationship with Jesus? Well, I think this kind of analogy of running like a child comes in handy again. Again, when I'm with my son, who's 10 years old, if we get to a park, if we're going somewhere outside, or if we go to the beach, almost always the same things happen. Happens. He'll get to the park, or he'll get to the beach, and whatever he's holding, maybe it's a ball or his jacket, he immediately throws to the ground, and he just starts sprinting. For no reason, he's not running anywhere, he's just full of joy of being out there, of playing. I never do this. There's very few times you'll you'll see me running out of joy. Uh, But that's because I'm weighed down with the worries of the world, right? It's this adulthood that's put so many layers of separation between me and really the truth of my existence. You know, children have the capacity to see with wonder and therefore to see things correctly. This reminds me of a quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson. He's a very famous American writer, a transcendentalist poet and writer who focused on the beauty of nature. And he once wrote this, To speak truly, few adult persons can see nature. Most persons do not see the sun, At least they have a very superficial seeing. The sun illuminates only the eye of the man, but shines into the eye and the heart of the child. There is some conception of reality that being childlike gives us that's truer than the ones we tend to build up through long lives of adulthood. And what this gives children the ability to do which we need to learn how to do too, is to let go of the things that separate us from being able to run to Jesus. Just like my son, if he's going to run, he knows he can't hold on to his stuff and run. He's got to drop that so he can get fast. He's got to drop it so he can be free. And I think there's two things we learn from this scripture, and just in general, that children are often able to let go of but things that we have to let go of if we want to be able to run to Jesus with that feeling of freedom. One thing we have to let go of is control. My son is always happiest when he's around his parents or sometimes his teachers. He knows they're in authority, they're in control, and he can just have fun. And when you let go of control, You're feeling that you have to be in control of everything. You allow yourself to be in a place of faith in God's control, in God's power over your life. And I think we see this in this text that we're reading today because there's an interesting little part of the story. When they 
get to Jesus, they see this. It says, when they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Theologians have often commented on this. They're like, Jesus told them to go catch fish, but when they get there, Jesus already has fish. And it seems like a a minor footnote, but what it means is that Jesus doesn't need us to bring anything to the table. Jesus is well taken care of. Jesus doesn't need our love. Jesus doesn't need to be in relationship with us. But he seems to want it. He wants our love, wants to be with us. And that's why he invites us in. He says, bring some of the fish you've just caught. He doesn't need it, but he still wants us to be a part of it. And this helps us understand our relationship to God, that we can really abandon some of that feeling of having to be in control. N.T. Wright, again, says it well. He says, Jesus welcomes Peter's catch. He asks him to bring some of it, but he doesn't, in that sense, need it. Of course, we are to work hard. Of course, we are to be organized. Of course, there's no excuse for laziness, sloppiness, half-heartedness in the kingdom of God. If it is God's work we're doing, we must do it with all our might. But let's have no nonsense about it all being up to us, about poor old Jesus being unable to lift a finger unless we lift it for him. In fact, we're much more likely to work effectively once we get rid of that paranoia-inducing notion. Jesus remains sovereign. And thank God for that. When we recognize Jesus' sovereignty over our lives, we let go of that need to feel in control. We see that happen in the narrative here, too. When they go fishing all on their own, they catch nothing. It's not until they listen to the voice of Jesus calling out to them, that things start to happen, that the fish get caught. And there's another thing that we have to learn to let go of. Once we can give Jesus control, we also have to let go of shame. And this seems really important for what's going on with Peter right now. We know from the Gospels that when Peter realized that he had just denied Jesus, he wept bitterly. But something's happened in that time where between weeping bitterly and seeing Jesus now, he's been able to let go of that feeling of shame so that he can leap out of the boat and run to him. He's found a way to embrace forgiveness And that, of course, is what letting go of shame allows us to do. It allows us to live now in faith of God's loving forgiveness. Jesus told us that we can have faith in that. He probably did so most famously in what I think is one of his central parables, the parable of the prodigal son. Now, this is a story that Jesus told. Most of you are probably familiar with it, but he told the story of a young man who went up to his father and said, Father, I want to leave your house, and I know you have an inheritance for me when you die, but I want it now, and I'm going to leave, which was a very insulting thing to do at the time, but the father says, okay, if that's what you want to do, gives the son his inheritance. The son goes, spends it all wastes it all on wild living, finds himself laying in a ditch and starving. And then Jesus tells the story like this. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. And what this story teaches us is that when we run to God, God runs to us. We see it in this story. The father was filled with compassion for his son. It says he ran to his son. That this isn't just a relationship where we can run to safety, but we're running to a God that runs to us. A God that wants to be with us, that wants us to let go of shame, to hand control over to him. In that childlike way where we can abandon the illusion of control that we have, abandon the power of shame, because one other thing has happened since Peter denied Jesus. One other thing has happened since, G- since Peter sinned. And that's, of course, Jesus died on the cross for the forgiveness of all of our sins. And with that authority, he is able to take our shame, to take control of all reality, and have sovereignty over our lives. And that's the story of the gospel, that we, when we find ourselves weighed down by shame, by guilt, that we can run in faith to the forgiving presence of a living, reigning, and loving Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that you wait for us with open arms. We thank you for your power over our lives, that we can hand our lives over to you. We thank you for how often you've told us in your word that you are waiting for us to run to you and that you'll run to us. And Lord, I just pray for anyone here that's weighed down by shame, by guilt, by sin. Whether it's someone that's known you for years or still hasn't given control of their lives over to you. I pray for your Holy Spirit to be on them now. We pray that they understand your forgiveness and your love. We thank you, Lord Jesus.